let's kick off. I assume some people will join us during kickoff, but um, the more the merrier. Uh, so let's start very uh, unmodestly by introducing myself. My name is Kirsten Kopolse and I'm the COO of the New Fork. And at the New Fork, we bring blockchain to the agri-food sector with our open public blockchain solution, Open Food Chain. And of course, the aim of that is to um, optimize supply chains to reduce risk. And of course, which is the theme of today, to improve sustainability. So let me make the round and let, let the panelists introduce themselves. And let's kick off with what for me is the left hand upper corner, Henry. Henry Gordon Smith, go ahead. Can you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Henry Gordon Smith. Uh, in 2014, I started a company called Agritecture, and we're global consultants that advise on local food systems, urban agriculture, and high tech indoor farming, greenhouses, and vertical farms. So, if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Henry. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker of today, um, and that's Mariana Vasconcelos. Could you also briefly introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Mariana. I'm co founder and CEO at AgroSmart. We are a Latin American based agtech that supports the whole agriculture supply chain to be more productive, sustainable, and climate resilient with data. Brief and um, very clear. Uh, brings me to the next speaker of today, Guy Kolonska. Could you also introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Uh, yeah. My name is Guy Kolonska. I'm the co founder um, and CTO at Infarm. Um, as the CTO at Infarm, I'm in charge on stitching together hardware, software, and crop science to create the technologies behind our vertical farms. Um, Infarm has been existing since um, 2013 um, and went through a few different evolutions um, until we have started really going much deeper into science and technology and offering a sustainable solution for primarily retailers on offering local produce. A subject I think we're going to touch upon today, local produce, so maybe a spoiler for what's to come. But first of all, of course, Eva, oh, yeah, you're still there. Eva Tekens, can you also introduce yourself, please? Yes, of course. Uh, so my name is Eva. Um, I'm, uh, I have two hats today. I'm a Chief Investment Officer for Renature. Uh, Renature helps um, farmers transition to regenerative agriculture. Um, and I'm also wearing the hat of uh, Meraki Impact, a uh, sustainability arm of a, a Brazilian family office that invests in funds that have the same theory of change, which is all about sustainable food systems and with um, special emphasis on uh, the impact on the environment. Uh, and that um, brings me to my next speaker of today, Christine Gould. Could you also uh, give a brief introduction? Hi, um, I'm Christine Gould, founder and CEO of Thought for Food, an organization that has also been around since 2013. That seems to be the year for food and ag innovators. Um, we are actually an organization that's dedicated to building next generation startups uh, that are transforming food and ag all around the world. And so we mean that literally in the sense of working with the next generations of millennials and Gen Zs, connecting them into food and ag. But we also mean it in terms of developing next generation solutions using cutting edge technology, as well as business models that are regenerative and inclusive to shape um, food systems for the future. Spoiler for today, because technology is also certainly a subject I want to touch upon. First of all, we have one more introduction list. Uh, Sharon Sutton, could you also please introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. So although uh, I've been around a while as well, um, I just founded a new company called Edible Planet Ventures that wants to be the connecting tissue between ecosystems to promote collaborations and best practices around the globe. So uh, from global to local and vice versa. Um, we're a brand new startup, but um, 
ready to get kicking and to transform the future of food through collaborative approaches. So nice to see this um, diversion here in, in speakers in how learned companies are active and indeed the different types of companies that we have present here. And of course, maybe also important to remember that we're not the only ones joining here, although this is the faces you see on your screen, but we certainly also have people joining us and listening in. And I would like to invite them to uh, feel free to leave comments and questions in the chat or maybe in the Q&A. Uh, and I will have an eye on that. And um, if there's anything interesting there, I will certainly share it with our panelists of today. But maybe let's kick off with the elephant in the room, as in we are here online for a reason. And that reason is, of course, the corona pandemic. And it didn't only have an impact on the way we work together and the way we do conferences together, but of course also on our food systems and maybe some trends that were already present were accelerated a bit by this, or maybe it's brought out issues that we were maybe not as aware of. So I would like to ask our panelists if they have any, uh, if there were any things that they experienced in COVID, uh, also of course with the sustainability angle in mind. So any, any things that uh, stood out for them? And I see Guy nodding uh, very uh, intensely. So maybe I would like to give the word to you for the first uh, kick off here. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been, a, of course, a very uh, eventful uh, time, I think, for, for everyone. Um, at Infarm, the influence of the pandemic was, you know, really providing a, a, a push, I think, for what we do and, and the solution we provide. I think that the, the breakdown we saw specifically at the beginning of the pandemic of supply chains um, had a, a tremendous impact, impact on um, our, our partners, our, our the clients, retailers, essentially. You know, they experienced a, a huge increase in sales as people were forced to, to stay home. Um, restaurants were closed at that time and people were cooking more. So there was a huge demand, you know, a panic at some point as well, right? And we were working uh, around the clock with all the, the safety requirements that means as well, with double shifts and so on. Um, and not double, but like um, parallel shifts. And yeah, we saw a, an uptick in, in demand, an uptick in, in sales, um, in, in conversion rates. And that has brought us actually to, to, to a fundraising during the pandemic time um, in order to support our teams and accelerate our um, expansion even further. I think it the reliance on this long distance travel with many borders in between um, on one side and the other, the reliance on labor, you know, cheap labor, which is quite often being brought from um, other places that completely paralyzed some parts of the food industry um, or severely damaged what's possible. So I think many farmers ended up being stuck with a lot of produce that they couldn't get to where they, um, where consumers are. And that's where we kind of stepped in and able to provide our solution growing in some cases an hour away from a distribution center of retailers and, and almost being not affected by it. So quite, quite interesting. And we see how that trend is definitely continuing. Um, and we see a, a, almost a consciousness shift with the retailers themselves who have been traditionally very old school. And we, we see a shift there, how they they perceive local food system, how they perceive um, sustainability and impact as a whole. That's obviously not only connected to the pandemic, but many other mega trends that are happening, but it's definitely felt in the conversations we're having. Something I recognize, I think this is indeed part of something that maybe already started. So for example, I'm based in the Netherlands and more local food and an emphasis on shorter supply chain is something that's, for example, part of our government policy. But I think um, the global pandemic has created definitely a bigger awareness of this. 
And maybe I would like to invite Nadine to uh, introduce herself briefly, and then maybe you can already react if uh, indeed what COVID changed for you and your business, and if there's things that um, maybe, especially with the sustainability angle in mind, have changed or where the awareness has shifted. Hi everyone, and sorry for the delay. I had to hand over my newborn to uh, to my partner so I, I could join you guys. Um, so yeah, so I'm uh, I'm Nadine Bongaert, um, or now where I work as a senior scientist in molecular biology for uh, the French startup Gourmet, who is working on cell-based fog. Uh, we have ambitions to widen our products uh, towards all sorts of poultry uh, products um, based on stem cells. Our first, uh, first focus is really foie gras due to the ethical um, yeah, controversy that is also surrounding this, this product. And we believe that we can make a real difference here using our technology. Um, for co when it comes to COVID, well, I think it's very interesting is to see uh, the shift in thinking, of course, and how people perceive alternative uh, sources of, of meat, whether it's plant-based or um, cell-based meat, I think um, the, 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 the shift in awareness, but also in um, yeah, the people willing to try these types of foods is, uh, is very interesting. Uh, from a practical point of view, we had quite some issues uh, in our lab uh, because, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of the supply uh, of, uh, of things ranging from minus 80 freezers for vaccines, but also gloves and uh, all sorts of basic equipment you need to do the type of research that we are doing, was going towards uh, um, mostly COVID research. And even suppliers prefer to give the, the uh, demand to those places that actually were doing COVID research such as, a, and, and that caused the startup like ours sometimes to be stuck um, in the lab. So that was tough uh, from, from our point of view, but on the other hand, there were also very positive changes. Um, I'm looking at the rest of my panelists. Is there anybody that maybe wants to react to the previous? Ah, I see hands going up. Eva, go ahead. Um, and no, just it, it sounds very familiar what Nadine said, but then uh, for us, it, it was actually the other way around. I noticed from the uh, impact investments kind of uh, um, feel that there was very much an urgency uh, with COVID to redirect funds. And of course, a lot of funds were redirected really for the purpose of COVID-19, of course, lots into vaccine development, but also um, a lot of the funds we were invested in were um, giving emergency loans out, bridge loans to the portfolio companies. But we did notice as well a huge shift towards more awareness uh, of the needs to invest in sustainability. Um, so of course you're 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 very much operating in a niche, and it it might not be you know as obvious um, from the on start. But I did notice a, a shift in investments um, um, uh, decision making to really focus more on sustainability during this time. There may be some, uh, somebody else that also experienced the shift towards uh, sustainability. I see Henry, you muted yourself. Yeah, uh, mine's a little bit different. So, you know, we're consultants and we manage a popular blog about this trend of urban agriculture and, uh, you know, a lot of things that, that Guy does. And I agree with everything Guy said. I just wanted to add to that, that there was sort of this other group of people, which were these entrepreneurs that were observing these challenges around the world, right? Climate change, et cetera. And then the pandemic hit and suddenly they're all very interested. They're at home. You know, they want to start their businesses. So they all start planning these business plans for greenhouses and vertical farms, urban farms. And so we saw a huge uptick around March 2020 in, in demand uh, from these groups. But a lot of them didn't have what they really you know, needed to get started. They weren't really ready for consulting. They didn't have a site. They didn't have funding. So we actually accelerated the launch of something we were working on, which was a digital farm planning software called Agritecture Designer to respond to that. So it also like really catalyzed the digital aspects of our work and, and sort of helped us evolve from a typical consulting firm 
to a much more agile, you know, digital company. I was stuck in Oman during lockdown in March. And so I had to manage my team globally and we launched our first digital product. It was a whole adventure, but I think it's important to know that sort of all these social and environmental entrepreneurs came out of the woodworks. And even though they had full-time jobs, they suddenly had time at home to explore other things. And that was really exciting for us as well. We saw a huge uptick in government requests from the Middle East in particular, just to add to that. That was one of the other major things we saw as governments started creating incentives and you know, the UAE Food Tech Valley announcement was accelerated and various steps like that that I noticed. You tie in, in the digital aspect that you mentioned, um, Christine already, of course, mentioned that they're focused on new technologies. Um, how did this situation maybe accelerate the interest in what you're doing? Was that to Henry or to me? No, it was to you. It was to you, Christine. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I wanted to jump in and just um, reflect a few uh, on a few points and then answer that question. So one thing to say is that a lot of shifts were happening in the food system in general for the reasons that Henry mentioned. There's a increased awareness, particularly in the next generations um, around things like climate change and an interest in supporting, you know, more transparent uh, supply chains. All of that was accelerated with COVID. Now, um, you know, there's a big link, of course, to COVID and food. Uh, and the, you know, this the, they suspect COVID started right in a wet market, which caused a lot of people to talk about kind of uh, you know the proximity of humans to animals and intensive agriculture. Then, of course, people who were suffering from COVID tend to be suffering from malnutrition. And of course, chronic illness related to, you know, kind of, again, another side of malnutrition, which is uh, overconsumption, you know, obesity, etc. And so these uh, heightened awareness around um, some of the things that are being talked about beyond sustainability, but about how food can play a role in health and can be right? Not just as a solution for health, but preventative. So to this point, all of the areas that, you know, this um, panel is representing, be it you know, localizing food through vertical farming, be it finding alternatives to meat production, be it, you know, regenerating oils and biodiversity, the, like the work Green Nature is doing. I think you're seeing, or, you know, in the case of Mariana too, about bringing more sustainability and productivity and not having that trade off that existed before. These are the kinds of things that are like now being mainstreamed. And, um, like I said, they were like already of interest to the next generations, and now it's like, okay, this has to happen. And then you could you combine that with the fact that this year is the UN Food Systems Summit. It's the first time the UN is looking at foods through a systems lens. They're looking at food as it relates to climate, to health, to nutrition, to economic development. Um, COP26 this year, which is the big climate change convention. And so there's just so much momentum converging, which means that this sector is like going to be reinvented. And I think like to Henry's point, we're feeling that too with the entrepreneurs we're working with. It's like the time is now investment is flowing into this space. There's so much interest in building solutions. Governments are getting in on the action and the rapid digitization that we're all feeling, you know, now meetings are happening over or in hop in or whatever platform that rapid digitization it's translating into agriculture which is the least digitized industry sector there is we're seeing you know that coming into food tech which is the hot space right now so it's really like the moment for sustainable food i would say and um it's imperative i think that we all like you know don't fall into the hype machine that we're still asking ourselves critical questions you know, so that we don't replicate the mistakes of the past with new technologies, but, you know, some exciting things are about to happen. And I think like the next generation is a big part of that. I recognize what you're saying. I think this is indeed also part of a trend that already started maybe. So to exemplify, I'm part of uh, the Nourish Movement Advisory Committee there, and they focus on food is, is medicine. And it already started pre-COVID, but it's now indeed accelerated. And I think I shall share in nodding, actually. Do you recognize that indeed food is seen as more of a part of a whole than uh, a separate area? Yes, actually, um, to to build on what Christine was saying, um, 
well, when we all experienced something at, you know, at once, you also saw the different parts of the world, the critical issues that every different part of the world had, right? The U.S. had very different issues than we had in Europe. Um, they have uh, issues with, you know, malnutrition and type 2 diabetes at a rate that we don't have, right? Um, what we've experienced um, was a, an acceleration of the digitization processes uh, all over, from retail tech to food tech to any tech, uh, which was, in a way, excellent. It took us, uh, I think, we would have done this work in 10 years have COVID not happened. Um, but this brought uh, an overall, I think, uh, interest in the sector as they was they were saying that i i hope um will not in a way uh crack under pressure <laughs> because if you we look at you know um take you know the the you know alternative meat sector right i mean the amount of money and investments um it's like a huge bubble but are we really thinking about the supply chain as a whole? Like, are we looking at all the aspects of, you know, the food system when we're, you know, when we have these mega trends? So these are questions that I really started to ask myself, looking at uh, these humongous trends that not that weren't there before, I mean, we knew that they were there, but it seems like that was, now there is like a craze, right? It's the next big thing. Um, and the same goes, with you know what is going to be here to stay and what's going to go once we go back to semi-normal and we know everything will you know in a way change will be you know maybe less in the office and more you know on a hybrid model um but you know uh, that's one big question right solve the issues that we saw in each of our territories and governments indeed are putting a lot of money and effort to to get you know things rolling um understand that there are underlying issues that we need to focus on because of this acceleration we can't you know just fix a piece and not think about what's happening and take whatever was good and build on that um so that's sort of my take I think as a representative of the alternative meat sector, I would like to ask Nadine to also maybe react to you. And do you indeed feel this acceleration? And maybe is there also a downside or are there maybe questions that are asked? Because of course, uh, as Sharon said before, there is also more interest in the supply chain. Are, do you also experience questions or issues there? Well, I think it's, it's uh, a bit of a chicken and egg situation to be honest because uh in many ways um things are are happening at, at the exponential speed at the moment you see that the first generation of uh, cell-based meat companies are now really you know starting to uh, make consumers experience their products just um had actually their first chicken product in a restaurant in singapore not so long ago um but uh, and and many others are really far in uh, in starting to launch their cell-based meat products uh, on the market as well. What's really challenging for us, in, still a big challenge, is to scale up, and we don't even know exactly what technology will be the ultimate um, you know, the ultimate factory for producing these types of products. And maybe we will have uh, a variety of types of infrastructure that we need for making, let's say, um, a steak versus something like we are making a foie gras. That's a completely different type of technology you would need to mass produce this. So um, in a way, I think it's already smart to think about the infrastructure because uh, otherwise uh, you will bump into many issues once you're ready. On the other hand, there are also so many uncertainties. It is really difficult to start building the infrastructure already, and you may lose a lot of money and, and time uh, by doing so. So it's a very tricky balance. Um, beyond sort of the physical infrastructure, we also need new regulation. And I think regulation is really, really complex, especially in Europe. Um, 
the FDA is already uh, more ahead of, of how they want to um, yeah, regulate cell-based meat products. And Singapore is really the number one. But for example, in France, uh, we have a minister of agriculture who already tweeted not so long ago that he uh, doesn't want his kids to eat cell-based meat. So um, you can see that also cultural aspects, and especially in France, where meat is, of course, a very high priority and very well protected, it's going to be very difficult for uh, companies like ours to fight against that or not even, you know, preferably we don't want to fight, we want to have a conversation. Um, but I hope you understand that we have to deal with this type of cultural differences also in order to create a holistic infrastructure. So um, many challenges ahead and also very difficult to determine when is the right time to do what. For answer, you touched upon consumer um, demands and I think something I would like to explore a bit more in this panel. And maybe let's give the word to Mariana because I assume that you have lots of data on um, what's grown and changes there. And maybe you can share a bit what the trends are there and uh, to what extent those are driven by consumer demands or an increase in uh, demand for sustainability. Yeah, totally. I just would like to add to what Nadine says. And if you look to Latin America, for example, um, meat has a meaning. It's not just the food, right? There's this whole cultural rituals of doing the barbecues and so on. So it's a big paramount, like uh, it's a big shift that you cannot just uh, assume it's just the food. And that's why I think our countries, Brazil, for example, leads an initiative on um, zero carbon meat production, right? Like, so how do we use different food production systems so you can avoid the emissions and the impact that they are being accused for. So I think there will be coexistence of different models uh, and it will depend on the maturity and cultural beliefs of each uh, people, right? Um, so about the consumers and trends, uh, I believe like North America and Europe define the consumer trends, I would say. So usually they are the ones to start demanding for plant-based and more sustainable and more traceability and boycotting uh, the, the emerging countries on, on how to produce and when to sell. But we start seeing a change here as well. So like the new generations uh, are more conscious about it. But at many times in emerging country, the income equality is not enough to prioritize what we would call maybe like more sustainable produced food. And that's a thing I believe we need to work on, on like using technology to democratize the sustainable production of food so it can be cheaper and like reach out to the consumer in supermarkets better. But I believe the corporations uh, are leading that movement here. So like uh, because they come from Europe and that turns out to be like a, a global standard, let's say like that, the food companies like Nestle, uh, ABM Bath, Coca-Cola, even Cargill, they're all making their commitments to become net zero and to only source from smallholder farms or to only source from regenerative ag. And those commitments become changes in the farm reality, like right? So they start to subside and invest in programs on how to help farmers transition to that so they can later only source from, uh, from those standards. So that's where I think uh, the change is coming from, mostly in Latin America. Like there is a consumer push for those brands in the developed countries. And then they come back here. It's like, okay, we need to adapt as well. Because if they made a commitment, everyone has to do it. And it, like it's a chicken and egg. What we, we talked to Nadine is like when they do that and the farmers have more accessibility for financial instruments and technology, then they are able to produce better and cheaper and that becomes more attractive to, to the consumer. Still, I believe we face many challenges um, to, to overcome. Like the pandemic, we were talking here, it was very important to accelerate transformation. So farmers before, uh, they knew they had to change because they need to tackle climate change and produce more, but it was very slow. And with the pandemia, they had to face daily realities that were that were like complicated. They couldn't buy inputs, they couldn't go to the fields, the migration workers couldn't come. So like the whole industry that has to audit 
for coffee certifications, for example, is there like they cannot go to field. So how do we do that remotely? How do we adopt technology? So that was a big change. Uh, and everyone was worried we, if we were still be able to export. So that's about economical development, right? Like our, our countries depend heavily on exportations of commodities and so on. And, and the deforestation of Amazonia was also a big uh, discussion lately. Uh, once we see the pandemic, like everyone raised awareness of global chaos and what could happen if we don't stop deforestation now, if we don't limit climate change now. So that's driving a lot of initiatives and, and awareness. Um, we need to have a safe and a resilient food system. So I agree with Christine, there was this shift for the food system. Before it was just agriculture. And now it's like we think as a food system. And, and, and that's a big change in, in my opinion. I think you're definitely right. And that's indeed becoming a trend to indeed see it as a system. And I think indeed what you mentioned on the Amazon is also quite actual. And I think it's indeed the case where maybe not the consumer per se, but indeed also companies and also retailers in this case do drive change. Um, and I would like to ask Henry, who do you think is indeed accelerating change for um, uh, towards more sustainability in supply chain? Since you, of course, have contact points uh, throughout the supply chain, do you think it's consumer demand or would it be retailers anticipating consumer demands or the bigger companies or maybe all of those or something different? Yes, so we've advised on We're advised in products around the world in 26 countries, but most of our work is in North America, Europe, and the Middle East. And I think that there's some underlying trends that exist uh, throughout those markets that's driving this localization even before COVID hit. And some of those you mentioned, um, which is just a, a greater awareness. It's like the local food movement is sort of piggybacked on the organic food movement. And local is starting to really outcompete in some markets organic. Uh, local is the brand that consumers feel is more trustworthy. They're putting money into the local economy, but most importantly, they, they really seem to perceive it as cleaner and safer and, and better for themselves. I mean, they really, they re it's, it's logical for them that if it's closer to them, it's, it's healthier, it's more nutritious, more flavorful. So that's really the main drive around the world. But if we look in the Middle East, for example, perceive as higher quality. And so when these new vertical farming companies start up there, they have to sort of navigate this challenge of how do they market local? There is some minor local production in Saudi Arabia, even the UAE. It's often perceived as um, you know, dirty and cheap and low quality. It's, it's definitely not year round. And so there's some interesting adaptation of marketing that we're seeing happening there. I think in Europe, one of the interesting drivers is sustainability. You know, I think sustainability is, is a much like looser term in the United States, but in Europe, it's a deep commitment um, that seems to be around the circular economy, um, the idea of the new green deal, and just a, a deeper expectation. You know, France was mentioned by Nadine. It's much more difficult to get these projects going in France than anywhere else because of terroir and the commitment to the culture of food and that technology for, you know, you can't just skip the line of making good food with technology, right? There's a, there's a process, there's a culture, there's a journey. In contrast, in the US, a big driver right now is just liquidity and the ability for investors to pump a lot of money to these companies and the willingness to take these risks and bet. And so, you know, they, they differ. I, I usually present a whole chart of the differences between these various markets and what's driving them. But really, it's consumer demand, you know, the, the long term trends of pandemic and climate change, and also that, that um, you know, some of the, the plays of what did I mentioned here, sustainability, that was the other one, sustainability policy. And then even within the regions, there can be some variations. So from our perspective, this is why we think it's even more important to remember that there is no one size fits all. The more planning that you can do to prepare in advance, to consider scenarios, to run options between soil, greenhouse, vertical, alternative meats or regenerative agriculture, the better. That's the kind of thinking we need. Um, that's the kind of thinking I've inherited from Thought for Food. I see Christine you know, uh, cheering me on, but that's what we really believe. And that's why our practice is about breaking down all these different ways we can innovate agriculture, especially urban agriculture into typologies. What does a rooftop farm that's an acre do? Where does that work and where does that not work? What does a greenhouse do? Where does that work, where does it not work? And, and I think that, you know, some of the mentions about what technology can or can't do or solving the systemic problems will be fixed by helping make sure we have a you know, diverse discussion about the options available on the table, systemic thinking. 
it's in a key touch upon many points that I would like to explore here indeed funding technology but before I would dive a bit deeper into that I would like to give the word to Guy because of course we talked about local food and you're the expert here at the table uh, do you recognize Henry on those uh, points and maybe in your answer describe the area where you're active and how that compares to indeed other areas um yeah there is a you know I, I really relate to this there is no one size fits all and i think that has to do with the expansion of the framework right if we were looking at the industrial agriculture revolution on you know optimizing just one thing right you want to get as as much possible as much food the least amount of of costs um, environmental concerns health concerns societal concerns are look they're not as important and now as we are kind of broadening that view we're taking a lot more variables uh, when designing those solutions and every environment every culture is different every geography is different and all of these things kind of lead to a multitude of solutions but of course there is a common um, framework here right on which I think, by the way, the pandemic has really pushed that we're all in this together, right? I'm, we've heard this sentence so many times on how we're all so connected and our, the world is so fragile and really need to work together as one in order to solve those issues we have coming. Um, and I think local food is, you know, one of those things which is not the only way definitely not uh, but it it solves a, an important aspect of gaining efficiency right it is a lot more efficient in terms of the supply chain but also offering something which people want which is more biodiversity and um, well uh, maybe some types of agriculture at least Yeah, that's the. I'm I'm optimistic on on that front. I just hope we can move fast enough. And of course, that creates a nice bridge because for moving fast enough, we need money. So let's explore the subject of funding. And I would like to give the word to Ava. Um, what do you see as interesting areas or areas gathering interest for funding right now? And especially, of course, keeping the sustainable sustainability angle of our discussion in mind. And uh, after maybe Sharon, you could react to that. Uh, yeah, whoa, that, that is a big question to answer. <laughs> um, I think from Green Nature's point of view, what we're noticing is that um, the majority of our portfolio, so the majority of the farmers that knock on our door asking to transition to regenerative and whether we can help them, um, they don't have access to finance. Um, and also to expect a farmer to born that investment alone wouldn't be realistic either, especially if we're talking about consumer trends, if we're talking about investors, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't make sense to expect that they do uh, that investment. Um, well, we, the, then we have a smaller part of the portfolio, which is really big corporates uh, like Nestle, Nespresso, that ask us to evaluate their value chains. And of course, we immediately jump on board. We say, yes, you know, we need to have these corporations set the bar high. We need to have an Nespresso say, you know, we can do coffee. We can do great coffee. We can still have George Clooney and do regenerative coffee. Um, so that's that's really you know, that that's the type of but what we notice is that these big names don't necessarily um, bring the scalability that we had hoped for and the reason is that there's still a lot of misinformation there's still a lot the need to to educate um, what sustainability really is about, uh, what is regenerative agriculture, what does it mean, um, does it bring more risk, um, is my coffee of lesser quality, uh, am I asking my farmer to give up on his yields so that he's, you know, saving the environment whilst he's mostly concerned about food security. So these are really um, important questions that we feel 
are still not completely answered to those that have the most power to change things. And that's the investors and, and, and the corporations from, from uh, Renature's point of view. Um, on the other end, like my work at Meraki and the funds we work with, we're obviously very much focusing on the funds that have you know, a, a theory of change that is around sustainable food systems. Um, and we do notice that, again, there's a rush to invest in this type of things. Um, there's a lot of funds popping up as well uh, that want uh, to start investing in this. Uh, almost too many, you'd think, uh, because there's a lack of focus as well. And we start throwing money everywhere. But um, what we've seen is that there's still um, a gap or a hole in the market, and that's really the technology, ag tech, for sustainable food production. I think that's really something that is missing. It's something that we're also trying to encourage very much from Miraki's point of view. Like, There's a lot of challenges in regenerative agriculture, for instance, and one of those challenges is technology. Um, but you don't really find um, there. I'm sure there are the solutions are there, but the funding to scale these solutions isn't. I don't know if I've answered your question. That's why I said it was a bit of a difficult one because I can I can kind of spread in in either direction. Um, but uh, I think in terms of availability of funds, and I've said that pretty much my whole career, it's not a problem of availability of funds. It's really a problem of matching these funds to the solutions. It's also a problem of uh, one size fits all mentality, thinking that, OK, um, we need to solve this uh, with a loan because we need to get a return on our investment. Um, and that's why we're also noticing a big shift now towards uh, blended finance discussions. How can we use blended finance to address uh, some of these financial needs? Um, and, and that's a really complicated, I mean, some people call it integrated capital because you want to integrate the grants and the loans and the equity and make it all work. Um, so I think, I think that's a huge, uh, a huge challenge. And I, at, at Renature, we're really trying to kind of bring these two together. Um, we have the willingness from farmers, from corporates. And we're trying to talk to philanthropists and investors alike to see, hey, how can we bring your funds together to really, you know, make this work and make the transition work to regenerative agriculture. Of course, I definitely want to dive into what you mentioned on uh, technology and maybe uh, technology solutions for every food, not making the connection uh, with finance. Um, and I would like to explore a bit more with Christine and Mariana. But first, indeed, Sharon, do you have anything to add or maybe to disagree for a change? Because I think in this panel, we all very much agreeing with each other, which is great. But um, <laughs> any opinions? Uh, well, yeah, unfortunately, when you get like a lot of people like us, it's difficult to disagree. Um, no fighting here. Um, well, to to just pick up on what was said which um i i do agree um what i what i notice is it's not only uh the money right the a systemic uh what henry was saying you you truly need a systemic approach um because it's not just the investors that need to help the farmers uh in our case it's even the you know the government uh, you need to train them. If you want them to use technology, you need to um, have them understand that it's not like their enemy. Uh, you know, using an iPad is not like the devil. Um, and, you know, when you have such deep roots, uh, like here in Italy, for example, uh, the conversation is even prior. It's not so much, you know, use technology, but it's like, you know, my grandparents you know, uh, farm this land for 100, 200 years of this way. And why should I just pick up and do something different? Um, and a, a lot of our local farms uh, are not, you know, mass producing, right? We're not uh, in other parts of the world where you're like, you know, to have good lettuce, it's 10 bucks at, you know, Whole Foods here. It's like, it's accessible to people. We don't have a food inequality problem like there is in the United States. 
So every part of the world should look, I think, to, we have to look systemically at everything and then dive deep in what our issues are. And it can't just be left to uh, the individual, like the investor or, you know, the big corporation. No, no one person alone will help uh, if we don't sort of aggressively um, and systemically have a sort of a, a united approach. Um, this is, you know, my experience being sort of bi-coastal, right? I live both in Europe and the U.S., and it's, like, so different. Uh, the issues are, you know, op polar opposite at times. Um, and, indeed, I agree with, with Ava. It has to be, uh, you know, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, there is, uh, you know, there is land that we have issues with the, you know, soil nutrition and the nutrients in our soil, um, but they don't apply to everyone. You know, they, they, they don't apply to every single part of the world. One technology cannot use, be used for everything. So every problem I do believe has a solution, but we sort of need to attack them on many fronts. touch upon your point of uh, technology awareness. I think an issue that we face and we do change for the agri-food sector is that our ideal clients might not know that they are the ideal clients so that they are not aware that blockchain is something different than Bitcoin or at least that Bitcoin is not all that blockchain can do and indeed the possibilities it has for the agri-food industry. So maybe, Christine, is that something that you do recognize that maybe the value of what you can bring um, to potential clients might not be recognized. And indeed, let's also tie in the previous point on uh, the funding gap for agri-food technology solutions. Christine, um, I think you're still on mute. I think you're still on mute, actually. Still, still on mute, but um, OK. Uh, then maybe let's ask the question first to Mariana and we will revisit you later. And Mariana, you of course bring also a technology component to the agri-food sector. Um, do you have any specific technology sustainability related challenges? I believe uh, it's a term of maturity. So I, I believe like it doesn't matter if it's Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, blockchain and so on. In agriculture, we are talking about a different world. Right. So like everything works differently in order to build the trust required in order to to have materials that will survive under open field and extreme weather conditions to create models where we have to uh, we cannot prepare data sets and it might take several seasons. So we have like enough data sets to work on. So uh, I believe technology is very important and has been um, gaining scale and each time, but I don't think the challenge is the technology. I think the challenge is like is in the system to support the technology to scale. So what in what Eva mentioned, like the education, is like the technology can adapt and we can find different ways. And there is innovation not only in using digital, but a lot to be done in process and integration and so on that the, the deliver the results we need. So what we need is like to, to educate everyone and it's very expensive um, and very few governments took on that challenge. So I think it's still in the majority of the hands of the NGOs and the startups. There are the people that do not have the resources to do that in scale. So we need all the stakeholders in the food system, including governments to take on some responsibility. In Brazil, they created some programs like right now, the agronomy courses starts to have like a mandatory classes on technology and sustainability, but it's very far away from what we need. Because in the end, like Eva said, when we get to the field, they are very insecure and you cannot build trust and transition if they don't really know the, the outputs, right? Um, and, and another um, um, challenge besides uh, education would be connectivity. In emerging countries, the majority of the places do not have internet in the field. So if you're thinking about adopting any of the technology, it won't work. So we really need to push harder on the agenda for bringing internet for everyone. And we continue to evolve to new technologies. That's why I say it's not the, the issue there. Now it's 5G, but none of the ones before 5G got to the field. 
So it's like, I'm not, I'm excited about 5G, but I'm not actually excited about 5G because I heard about LoRa and Sigfox and Aeroband IoT and every single communication protocol that didn't get there. It's like, we first need to be sure that we can assure that they will have access to internet so we can use the full potential of technology itself. And, and for that to happen, we need financing. So I totally agree with Eva on the blended finance. Like we need to use finance in all of the parts of that uh, system to afford and invest in technology to, to remove the barrier of testing. It's like if there is not enough education, they need to test. And if we need, uh, if we have financial access, then more people are able to test and have returning investments and have use cases that can later be shown to educate more people. And even connecting with the benefits. So uh, farmers say, why will I invest in technology and be more sustainable? Who will pay for that? Because the, the balance between the, the risk and return is already unfavorable for the farmer. He takes all the risk and very few of the return. The rest of the supply chain like captures the value. So everyone pushed the farm that he has to change. He has to transition to regenerative. They have to, to adopt the, the new technologies, but no one wants to pay for that. Like they have a very hard time getting loans, uh, very few subsides from the other corporations in that supply chain that are interested. So the new green bonds and the, and the carbon credits and all this regulation is very important because that could open a door for monetizing that investment from the farmer and giving it back to him so they can continue to invest and actually scale. So I think we are at the moment and I'm at my thoughts like for 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 the, coming to the end of the panel would be like we really need to um to 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 get together to put things at scale we won't get 20 30 goals just by doing pilots and that's where everyone is right now and for coming out of pilots and greenwashing in the market oh i'm a sustainable brand and i'm doing that we need to solve these three pillars education infrastructure and financing Great. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I think indeed it's very important that um, we take into account that we all want sustainability, but indeed who's going to pay for it and after implementing something, how can we continue and make sure that it ends up being a sustainable business model as well. Uh, and indeed, as you said before, we're nearing the end of the panel. Um, so I would like to make the rounds and ask you all the same question. Namely, what are some trends or developments that you expect the most impact from from the coming five or ten years? And then, of course, it, it impact speaking on sustainability impact. And at this moment, top left of my screen is Guy. So take it away, please. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think the, the the biggest trend, which is in general in technology, right, is just that cognification of all steps of the process from the, the farming um, to the processing and distribution and um, consumption, all of these things which are being digitized now and, and later on added intelligence to are gonna have, that, that's a trend that's gonna have enormous impact on, on quality uh, on one side, on yield of, of, from farms, um, and at the end on resource use. All of this is going to translate, um, hopefully, to you know, better quality and more accessible prices. So it's a, we, we've seen it happening in many other um, areas um, in the world. And I really hope that uh, the zeitgeist is with us to, for this to happen in agriculture and food in general. Answer well, as promised, I'm going to ask you all the same question. So, Ava, what's your answer to this question? Huh, um, I think, uh, there, listen, to, I'm gonna try and keep it short. I listened to this amazing, amazing, inspirational speech by Rion Brandt, uh, last year when I followed, um, uh, Think Leadership uh, course. And he spoke about co-emerging futures. And, and for me, it really stayed in my head because it has everything to do with trends. Uh, and, but if, if summarized, it's basically, will humans be part of nature or above nature? Um, and that really resonates with me and all the work that I do. And I think and hope um, that the trend will be that we will be part of nature and that we will start respecting um, the boundaries, planetary boundaries, and that we will now finally, and, and if I look at, 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 
younger generations, there's also very much this drive. I really hope that that will be the trend, that we will start acting more consciously when it comes to decisions on food, um, what we eat, uh, what we put into our bodies, um, how we do things, how we treat one another, uh, etc. So um highly recommend by the way it's 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 a quite a quite a read but a beautiful report uh about um different futures of uh, uh ai uh, technology gaia etc and and how can we ensure uh that they you know co-emerge and coexist and not uh fight <laughs> between one another could, could i um, add to that because uh, i i think it's very interesting what you're saying and you know, the planet will be very well surviving without us. I think the real danger is um, that if we don't change, uh, we will actually be the victim here, not the other way around. Uh, and what I find very interesting is that uh, technology is based on biology, which I something I'm seeing in, in, in my field of biotechnology, is that we can make technology that seamlessly integrates with uh, with nature more and more. Um, our capabilities are expanding so rapidly. Um, there, a lot of education is required because uh, there is a lot of debate when it comes to, for example, GMOs. Um, using genetic engineering for food production is a huge topic. Uh, but if you ask me, I do think we need to tap into those capabilities, um, especially because the, the, the environment is changing so rapidly that natural evolution simply can't keep up with that. And so the only way out in some circumstances might be that we need to adapt our food a little bit so that we can at least keep our ecosystems alive. Maybe it's not the most, I mean, it's debatable whether that's natural or not. It so it becomes a whole philosophical topic, um, but at least Technology-wise, I see that we're advancing very, very rapidly in this direction, and it is a tool that we can use in order to create a society and a production system that hopefully contributes to the sustainability issues. What do you see as uh, the major trends for uh, the next five or ten years? I mean, there's so many... That Now, um, of our understanding of sustainability and, and the move beyond hype to a more in-depth, uh, data-driven discussion about sustainability. Before I started Agritecture Consulting, I started Agritecture the blog. So I've been in the sector for about 10 years. And the amount of, of crap I've seen out there from marketing, from equipment companies to vertical farming companies, you know, vertical farming will feed the world. Biggest, you know, claim that's so ridiculous. And, you know, I think the the what i'm looking forward to and what i'm also afraid of is is this you know broader and deeper understanding of sustainability and what it means from a food perspective as the sector matures the good side is that entrepreneurs get access and and policymakers get access to more valuable sustainability data earlier so they can avoid and like work through the hype um, but the downside is that there's going to be a day of reckoning for some of these innovations that actually happen often have a higher carbon footprint than some of the alternative solutions as people get more mature and understand that. And so there could be a pulling back of the progress that's been made because of sort of this day of reckoning for not being honest from day one. And it's gonna be very complicated because it varies greatly depending on region and company and technology and scale. But I think that I'm concerned and also excited about how sustainability and the data and understanding of that pressure from ESG investors, pressure from policymakers, new solutions that provide transparency, how that's going to really evolve the sector over the next 10 years. It's a great answer. Uh, Sharon, do you have anything to add to this? Or to the other answers? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, to me, it's, you know, one thing that we often, in a way, don't, oh, not overlook because all here we know. I mean, food production employs 40% of the global workforce, and it's not just about food. It's about energy, it's about logistics, it's about packaging, it's about the impact that we, the food system in a way, has on the planet, right? So sustainability is such a, a broad term, right? If we don't massively then um, 
attack, I would say, some of the largest issues like plastics. Um, you know, the, the, the issue, and, and that's one that, you know, sometimes you're like, they are scratching your head, like everybody's working around farming. And yes, there's a lot of, uh, you know, startups doing innovation, uh, innovation around sustainable plastics. But what about the mess we already have, you know, and that is not a one startup effort. It's not a one impact investor effort. I mean, I think that is a global unity kind of let's all like put our thinking hats together effort and get this stuff done. Um, so, you know, that to me is one of those, uh, I would say, trends that it's, you know, it's there to stay just because it's not something that you can solve tomorrow, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it's so huge and so massive. Um, and you don't see the same amount of um, solutions coming out as uh, in other, you know, let's say areas and verticals. Um, and in addition, I'm very hopeful of the new generations. I mean, um, as a mom, 22 year old daughter, uh, I see, you know, how she was raised and how she thinks about our planet. And, uh, you know, back at Seeds and Chips, I had started this Teenovator program and bringing all these amazing kids. Um, and you'd see like 13 year olds, you know, with amazing ideas. So as much as, you know, our older generation screwed up the planet, um, I think they are on the right track to fixing it. Uh, that is my sincerest belief. Well, we're slightly over time, but still, we haven't heard from Mariana for his closing remarks. So, very short uh, closing conclusion of the trends you see. Maybe you can leave it in the chat. Um, and for now, I would like to um, thank all of our panelists for being here and sharing their very thoughtful and insightful uh, responses with us all. Um, and I think if you want to leave LinkedIn or any contact details in the chat for people to reach out to you, feel free to do so. And thank you very much for being here. And it was a great panel, very uh, stuff for thought, as we uh, say, stuff for thought, food for thought. Thank you all, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening.